The hospitable sea, as it is called, is self-contradictory in its nature and deceptive in its name. As you would not account it hospitable from its situation, so it is severed from our most civilized waters by a certain stigma which attaches to its barbarous character. The fiercest nations inhabit it, if indeed it can be called habitation, when life is passed in wagons. They have no fixed abode, their life has no germ of civilization. They indulge their libidinous desires without restraint and for the most part naked. Moreover, when they gratify secret lust, they hang up their quivers on their car yokes to warn off the curious and rash observer. Thus, without a blush, do they prostitute their weapons of war. The dead bodies of their parents they cut up with their sheep and devour at their feasts. They who have not died so as to become food for others are thought to have died an accursed death. Their women are not by their sex softened to modesty. They uncover the breast from which they suspend their battle axes and prefer warfare to marriage. In their climate, too, there is the same rude nature. The daytime is never clear, the sun never cheerful, the sky is uniformly cloudy, the whole year is wintry, the only wind that blows is the angry north. Waters melt only by fires, their rivers flow not by reason of the ice, their mountains are covered with heaps of snow. All things are torpid, all stiff with cold, nothing there has the glow of life. But that ferocity which is given to scenic plays, their stories of these sacrifices of the Taurians and the loves of the Colchians and the torments of the Caucasus. Nothing, however, in Pontus is so barbarous and sad as the fact that Marcion was born there. Fouler than any Scythian, more roving than the wagon life of the Sarmatian, more inhuman than the Massagete, more audacious than an Amazon, darker than the cloud of Pontus, colder than its winter, more brittle than its ice, more deceitful than Ister, more craggy than Caucasus. Nay, more, the true Prometheus, almighty God, is mangled by Marcion's blasphemies. Marcion is more savage than even the beasts of that barbarous region. For what beaver was ever a greater emasculator than he who has abolished the nuptial bond? What Pontic mouse ever had such gnawing powers as he who gnawed the gospel to pieces? Hello, my name is Joshua Papsdorf, and welcome to your course in church history. Uh, now, I have to imagine that in many of you's minds right now, uh, you're thinking something along the lines of, what on earth was that? Uh, well, I have a short answer to that and a long answer. Uh, the short answer is that that was the opening section or opening paragraph to a work called Contra Marcionum, which was written by the church father Tertullian. Uh, Tertullian wrote Contra Marcionum, or Against Marcion, uh, to refute the teaching of Marcion, a second century heretic. Uh, and so he wrote four books all together, uh, attacking his thought and showing how it was uh, contrary to what the church taught, and also, in fact, uh, internally inconsistent and self-contradictory. Uh, so that's the, the short answer. Uh, and we'll get back to talking about that uh, some more in a few minutes here. But I want to uh, give a slightly longer answer uh, here at this point in introducing not just this module, but introducing uh, you to the course as a whole. What I just uh, tried to give you there uh, is a little bit, a little glimpse of church history. Uh, and what I mean by that is that um, when we study church history, Right? We're not just studying a bunch of dates and places and names. Uh, we're not just studying a bunch of definitions of different doctrines or heresies or councils and controversies. Um, anyone can go to a reference book or go online uh, and do a quick search for Marcionism, do a quick search for uh, Tertullian, and get a standard account of what the doctrinal issues are, uh, the dates, the different works that were written, that sort of thing. Uh, but as it turns out, in fact, uh, most people uh, don't do that, right? That in today's world, most of us have uh, internet access of some kind. Uh, and any of you at any point in your life prior to this uh, probably could have gone online, uh, done a little searching around, and you could have found that work that I just read an excerpt from for free uh, on the internet. Uh, and you could find there uh, where it uh, gives you, along with the work itself, an introduction to Tertullian and his thought, and to Marcion and his thought, and you could have read it. 
but I'm willing to bet that most of you uh, have never read that work before and probably haven't read anything by Tertullian uh, and maybe haven't read anything by a uh, church father or other historical uh, theologian or, or church figure um, in addition to Tertullian. Right? And so the question is, why is that? Right? And I think that's because many of us think about church history uh, in those ways. Right? We think of it in terms of uh, dates and definitions and encyclopedia entries. Uh, and so what I want to do in this class uh, is we can never, of course, cover church history uh, in a comprehensive sense. What I want to do is to give you uh, a taste of it and a taste of uh, how I think we should approach church history. And that the way we approach church history, the way we learn about the church uh, and the way we should learn about the figures in the church uh, is the same way that we learn about uh, anyone, any figure in our life. Right? And we learn about people primarily through stories. Right? It's through uh, hearing people's stories, hearing the stories of their lives, that we really get a sense of who a person is. Um, this is why right, there's an entire literary genre of short stories. Right? And in short stories, um, in the really great ones, you can get a real sense of a character uh, in just a very short amount of time because of a story. Right? We get to see how the character thinks, we see how the character interacts with others and with his environment, and we can get a sense of a, a character uh, very quickly through a story, right? And in a way that is different from, and I think better than, you would get if an author wrote down and tried to just describe a character's mindset um, or a character's personality to us, right? That we get more of a sense of the character through a story. Right? The same thing, of course, happens in our own everyday lives, not just when we're reading things. Right? Uh, when we uh, first meet someone that we're going to be friends with, or especially, for many of us probably, when we met someone uh, who we eventually uh, fell in love with, or for many of us maybe even married. Right? In most cases, uh, what do you hear that the couple did uh, in their first few days together? Well. Uh, a lot of times they just spend hours uh, talking, right? And in those hours talking with one another, what are you doing, right? You're telling stories. Uh, I'll never forget uh, some of the first dates I went on with my wife, right? We would sit in a uh, coffee shop and we just talked uh, for hours, hearing the stories of childhood, hearing the stories of um, what we had done in high school and, and all these stories of our families and pasts and that that's how you really get uh, to know a person. And I think we should approach church history in a similar way. Right? We can read an account of Tertullian and Marcion and the debate between them uh, and understand the basics of it. Uh, but we're missing something crucial. Right? We're missing why this matters. We're missing uh, why these people cared so much. Why did they think the things they thought? Right? Why does Tertullian uh, attack Marcion uh, so vehemently, as you heard in that passage? Why does Marcion um, attack uh, his opponents in similar ways? Right? We, we need to have a sense of their story in order to understand the context, understand why this happened and why it was important. Uh, and I would also say, right, one of the other features of stories, and especially the kind of stories we use to get to know each other, uh, is that they grow and develop over time. Right? We, they grow and develop uh, as we grow up. Uh, so, for example, for many of you who have children, right, in, in the early years you read stories to them that are very simple, that are very straightforward, right? I probably read The Very Hungry Caterpillar and Clifford the Red, Big Red Dog about four million times at this point. Um, but little kids love those stories, right? They're very simple, they're very straightforward. Uh, if there's a conflict, if there's some crisis, uh, it's fairly minor and it's quickly resolved. Uh, and everyone goes away happy. Um, as we get older, right, the stories change. The stories become uh, more complex. The characters get more nuanced. The good guys aren't perfectly good. The bad guys aren't perfectly bad. Uh, there's a depth of character that begins to emerge. Uh, and sometimes the conflicts take longer, and sometimes the resolutions aren't perfect. And then, of course, once we are uh, grown up, once we're reading, uh, hopefully, um, some great literature, Right, we get uh, very complex stories. We get uh, lots of nuance and depth uh, and complications. Uh, and sometimes crises aren't resolved. 
sometimes there are uh, difficulties that, that linger on for the remainder of the characters' lives, right? And in some ways, of course, these stories aren't as fulfilling in a simple sense, but still, these are the classics. These are the stories we love uh, because they give us uh, better insight into real life, right? We understand the world better uh, through reading great literature or great history, uh, for that matter, right? As we learn more and more about the characters, as we get um, the bad stories in their background along with the good, we get a better sense of who they are, right? And again, the same thing is true in real life. Um, as we grow up, right, we hear stories about our parents, we hear stories about our grandparents. And when we're small children, um, those stories are pretty, pretty simple. My kids love to hear stories about uh, my childhood, mostly the ones involving uh, pets causing various kinds of problems. They love those stories about uh, misbehaving dogs and cats and what have you. Um, as they get older, right, we will tell more stories that are more complicated that they're able to understand. And then ultimately, once you're an adult, hopefully you can sit down and have uh, real conversations with your parents. Uh, you know, I've had conversations with my parents where I've heard stories of real difficult times in their lives. Uh, and while that is uh, kind of hurts, it's kind of emotionally difficult, uh, it also gives me a much greater understanding of who they are as people. Uh, and I value getting that understanding, not only because it helps me know my parents better, who I love, but also because it helps me develop as a person too, right? If all we ever hear are the happy, positive stories where everything is quickly and easily resolved, what do we do in our own lives, right? When we encounter difficulties that seem to drag on, that there's no quick and easy resolution to. Uh, and so all of this, I think, ultimately ties into and is similar to the way I would approach church history. That as we grow in our faith, as we grow in our understanding uh, of the church, right, we should be doing something similar, right? We should be getting uh, more stories. We should be getting more complex accounts of the church's history. We should be even looking at the periods where there were real difficulties, uh, real mistakes are made, there's real challenges, um, not only so that we can better understand and love the church, uh, which we ought to, but also because this will give us a uh, better ability to deal with issues in our own day, right? As one of the things we're going to see as we go through uh, some different episodes in church history is we will see that there are real struggles, that things take sometimes hundreds of years to resolve controversies. Uh, we will see that uh, in some cases, uh, church officials don't necessarily do the right thing, at least not at first, and that there are real challenges and mistakes that have to be overcome. Uh, now, of course, again, this is going to be difficult. This is going to raise some hard questions. But in the end, I think we'll have a better understanding of the church, uh, and will also equip us uh, when in our own lives we encounter the same kinds of problems. Right? Because what we will see is through all this messiness, through all these difficulties, uh, ultimately, miraculously, I would say, in a very literal sense, uh, the church emerges. The church uh, remains whole, uh, uh, the gates of hell do not prevail against it, right? That there are controversies where it looks like it couldn't possibly turn out well, but in the end, uh, it does, right? And I think this can, again, be very uh, important message for us to understand in our own lives when we see some similar challenges, some similar difficulties with no clear resolution in sight. We can know, in fact, that this has happened before uh, and that God manages to always bring the church through and to bring it through uh, in a way where it's more developed, stronger than it was when it entered into the crisis in the first place. Now as we look at the different stories that are going to make up our course together, um, there are going to be some kind of key themes that emerge uh, throughout these different controversies and that are going to tie it together and are going to provide a sort of basic um, understanding of church history and the development of doctrine uh, to kind of ground and supplement your understanding of these specific stories. Uh, and there are going to be some, some central themes, some key themes that come up time and time again uh, in the different controversies that we're going to look at. And now we're going to see that, of course, as we go through these different controversies, as we go through the course together. But even here at the beginning, I think it might be helpful uh, to just lay some of these themes out so that you have in mind um, what to be looking for, what some of the key things are going to be 
showing up as we go through these different controversies. Uh, so for example, one thing that is going to come up uh, in practically every doctrinal controversy we're going to look at is the question of how ought we to interpret scripture. Um, you know, one of the things that is uh, striking when we look at excerpts from different primary sources as we go through these different controversies uh, is how prevalent scriptural citations are. Uh, whether we're looking at uh, Tertullian or Augustine or uh, Aquinas or um, uh, works from uh, John Henry Newman or even things in the 20th century. Um, we're going to see time and time again, of course, uh, citations of scripture. Uh, and so in many ways, uh, all of these different doctrinal debates can be seen as debates about how to properly understand scripture. Uh, and we are still using today uh, essentially the same scriptures, the same authoritative texts that were being used 2,000 years ago. Uh, so it gives us a continuity uh, and it also makes uh, the debates that they were having 2,000 years ago relevant to us today because we are still needing to make sense of uh, these same scriptural sources. Uh, so how to interpret the Bible is always going to be an issue that comes up in these controversies. Closely tied to that uh, is an understanding of the body uh, and of bodily life and existence. Uh, you know, and one of the things that we see in Scripture, if you just pick up the book uh, and start to read it, is how bodily it is, how uh, really connected with the nitty gritty of life it is. Uh, and this is something that we as Christians may not always really appreciate. Uh, if you pick up um, the key texts of some other religious traditions, this isn't necessarily the case. Uh, there can be a much greater focus on uh, the mind and meditation and really escape from bodily existence. Uh, whereas in the Christian tradition, uh, from Genesis on through Revelation, uh, there is a real uh, embrace of our bodily existence as human beings. But of course, uh, just like with scripture, this is always controversial. This is always problematic. Uh, how do we understand uh, this bodily life? How do we stand the suff understand suffering? Um, how do we understand the, the, the tension that there seems to be between pursuing spiritual things and uh, bodily day-to-day -day existence, right? If I'm uh, busy eating or worrying about eating, how do I also contemplate God? Uh, and so, again, along with scripture, there's always going to be controversy and debate about how do we understand uh, bodily things. Uh, everything from sex and marriage to eating and fasting um, to the sacraments, right? Does God work through bodily means to interact with us? So that's going to come up time and time again as well. Uh, and again, connected to both of these uh, is the idea of authority, right? That uh, when we're debating about whether the body is good or bad, when we're debating how to understand scripture, uh, that's going to bring up the question of, well, how do we resolve these debates? Uh, where is the authority to make a final decision going to rest? Is authority based in a kind of a person's own uh, inspiration, a person's own expertise uh, or charismatic uh, qualities, or is authority rooted in um, a hierarchy and in tradition and in something like apostolic secession. Um, where does authority to make decisions ultimately rest? Uh, and again, that's going to run from uh, Marcion and Tertullian all the way through, of course, to the Reformation and into our own day. Uh, so again, this question of who has authority and how do we make final decisions is going to be a perennial one. Um, now when we're debating uh, the body, when we're debating scripture, when we're debating authority, um, in all of these different things we're going to see um, heresies come up from time to time, right, and these heresies tend to recycle, so uh, in a slightly different form we'll see the same heresy cropping up over and over again. Uh, but one of the things that we'll see as we look at different heresies uh, is that there is a, there's a tension, there's a, a paradox uh, when we look at heresies, that um, heresies are not uh, usually somebody setting out to become evil, right? Nobody sits down and decides, hey, I want to become a heretic. Um, what happens? Why are all these heresies cropping up? Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the, intention, the uh, inherent tensions and paradoxes uh, within 
Christian belief, right? That we do have uh, a lot of different topics, different areas where there's a tension, right? We have body and spirit. We have, um, we have faith and works. We have um, God is three, God is one. Jesus is human, Jesus is divine. Uh, and in all of these different areas, uh, there is this tension uh, that we have a tendency to, to want to simplify things, to clarify things, right? And this is, this is how theology works, right? That what we're going to see as we go through 2,000 years of history uh, is that theologians and the church are looking to clarify and to explain what it is we believe, and that's a good thing. Um, but there is always a tension, right? And if we try to explain things too completely, if we try to make things uh, clear and understandable and fit into a nice system, uh, we can often go too far, right? And that's basically what's going to happen in all of the different heresies we're going to look at. Uh, nobody sets out to do evil, to be a heretic. What they do is set out to clarify something, to explain something. Uh, but what they end up doing is taking something that has an inherent tension built into it and they oversimplify it. They make it fit with their understanding and in the process they end up distorting the faith and removing something essential from it. So if I'm going to determine yes there are aspects of bodily existence that are bad and problematic and that work against true spiritual living, um, there is truth to that. But if I take it too far and just decide well it seems clear to me that there's not any good in the body at all and that the Christian life should be solely about the spirit. If I make that move, it gives my position a lot of clarity, right? I end up not having to say, well, the body is good and the body is bad, and how do we balance that? I'm just going to say the body is bad. But in the process, I'm uh, jettisoning a whole uh, aspect of our faith, uh, and I'm going to end up, uh, basically, I'm a heretic, right? And this is what happens in all of these different... Uh, heresies that we're going to look at. So um, there's always going to be a tension, uh, and there's always um, in the heresies and the controversies somebody who's trying to resolve that tension in a way that doesn't really uh, capture uh, all the different aspects of our faith. So that's something we will see uh, time and time again. Uh, kind of building on that, uh, another thing that we're going to see that we're going to end this module with uh, is the fact that every time one of these controversies is solved, every time there is a uh, clarification or a uh, response to one of these heresies or controversies, it's always going to prompt more questions, right? So to give you a little teaser here of the end, uh, Tertullian is going to argue against Marcion that we ought to keep and maintain the Old Testament, um, but that's going to prompt a question, right? Because uh, there are aspects of the Old Testament that are difficult to deal with. So this is just going to prompt the question of, okay, if we're going to keep these aspects, keep these books, how are we going to deal with these texts, right? So there's always going to be a question that is prompted by uh, whatever answer we give to a heresy, right? We're never going to reach the end. We're never going to finally understand everything about God and our faith and our relationship with God. Um, okay, last couple of themes here. Um, shifting gears a little bit when we talk about these doctrinal debates, when we talk about these controversies, these heresies, uh, as I've said before, there's a tendency to kind of fall back into philosophy or academic terminology, uh, and we can end up oftentimes making these uh, very academic debates. Uh, and one of the things uh, I will return to time and time again as we go through the course is this idea of lex orandi, lex credenti. Now, what does that mean? Uh, well, first of all, uh, one thing just to note here is that uh, when you do a graduate program, uh, one of the key things you always want to be able to get is um, some good, impressive terminology to throw around to uh, convince people that you actually have a graduate degree. So, so here's our, our little tidbit of that for this module is lex orandi, lex credendi. Uh, and Latin phrases are particularly helpful for that uh, highfalutin education uh, image that we want to present to the world. Uh, but seriously, uh, this uh, phrase basically means uh, the law of prayer is the law of belief. And so, what do I mean by that, or what does that phrase mean? Uh, is that in all of these different debates that we've been talking about, it's about authority and scripture and the body, uh, when we're balancing these different tensions, 
all of that is ultimately rooted in the lived faith of the people. Uh, that it is the Christian life lived by the faithful around the world throughout time that is really the ultimate uh, source of all this theological development and debate that we're talking about. Um, it's people living the faith and trying to live the faith and trying to make sense of that that underlies all of this. Uh, now, how is this important? Well, one of the key ways this is going to be important is that um, there are going to be different answers proposed uh, in these controversies. Uh, and one of the ways, some, in many cases, that the wrong answers are rejected is because they don't fit with the lived faith of the people. Right? So, for example, um, one of the things we'll get to a little later on in the class is, is people rejecting the idea of Jesus' uh, true humanity uh, being combined with his true divinity in one person. Uh, and so as part of that, um, certain heretics denied the claim or the title to Mary of Mother of God. Uh, well, when this debate was going on, uh, one of the ways it was resolved is to look around and say, hey, um, the faithful all around the world are invoking the prayers of Mary as the mother of God, right? That this is a common part of our, of our liturgy, of our prayer life. Uh, and so denying that Mary is the mother of God can't be the right answer, right? That because it doesn't fit with the lived experience of the church. Uh, so lex orandi, lex credendi is going to be an important principle and still is uh, an important principle uh, till today. And then finally, uh, again connected with that, is that at the end of the day, all of these different debates are going to boil down to the question of, of how does this ultimately lead to or contribute to our salvation, right? That one of the reasons these debates are so passionate that we get um, the kind of passion that we saw in Tertullian and that we're going to see in many of these other uh, debates and controversies is because the stakes are so high, right? That this is not a debate about how to decorate uh, a temple. This is not a debate about, um, I don't know, the best way to invest our 401k, right? Um, so we might get a little better vacation as opposed to a less good one. Um, this is a debate about ultimate things in the end, right? That um, in all these different controversies we're going to look at, if we get it wrong, it's going to have uh, very serious consequences, right? That people's eternal salvation is at stake our basic understanding of what salvation is. Uh, and so uh, when we look at issues of what is going to be scripture, who's going to be our authority, what's the proper understanding of the body, um, all of these things are important because they're all going to shape our understanding of what salvation is, uh, how we attain salvation, and there really are no greater stakes uh, than that. Uh, so. Uh, just to wrap up, those are uh, some of the key themes that we're going to see time and time again uh, as we go through this course together uh, and look at these different controversies. So there will be a whole bunch of different specifics we'll look at, uh, and I understand that for some of us we're not going to remember all the details of these controversies um, years from now, but hopefully these key themes, these key ideas uh, will stick with us and can be helpful uh, later on. Uh, in our careers or in our lives when we're confronted with other controversies, we can fall back on our understanding of these themes and get a little clarity uh, in some of these complex debates. As we turn to take a look specifically at the issue of Marcionism and this debate between uh, Tertullian and Marcion, or I guess I should say uh, this, this critique of Marcion by Tertullian since uh, Marcion was never alive to, to debate with Tertullian when the latter was alive. One thing to, to just be aware of and to emphasize here is that, you know, this debate uh, in some ways is very focused on some of these themes that we just mentioned, right? So it specifically focuses on uh, the question of scripture, right? What is going to count as scripture? And specifically, we're going to count the Old Testament as authoritative scripture. Uh, and it also addresses the question of the body, right? That uh, Marcion is going to, along with rejecting the Old Testament, reject the goodness of the body and physical reality. Um, and in some ways we can, we, we tend to look at Marcionism as a debate about these things and therefore, uh, you know, that's how we're going to understand it. 
But again, to get back to this idea of the passion and why these things matter, uh, it's important to note uh, something we've alluded to a couple times here, but I wanted to state it specifically, that everything, all of these different themes, all these different principles are interconnected, right? And that one of the key things to understand about theology, both in general, uh, but also in this course, is that um, everything is connected. Uh, and if we make a change over in one area, it's going to have an impact uh, in the other aspects of the faith as well, even if we don't see an immediate connection. Right, so in rejecting uh, the Old Testament, rejecting the goodness of the body, Marcion is going to be radically changing Christianity as a whole. Right, this is going to change uh, the way people pray. This is going to change the way people worship. Right, physical sacraments uh, aren't really going to fit well with a system that rejects the goodness of physical creation. Um, our prayers are going to be different. Uh, the way we decorate uh, our worship spaces is going to be different. Um, the way we live our day-to-day -day lives is going to be maybe radically different. Um, our understanding of what our goal is, what is salvation going to look like, is also going to be radically different, right? So that uh, in looking at some problematic Old Testament passages and deciding to reject them, we can't just take that decision and isolate it. That it is going to have repercussions and consequences that stretch across the faith. Uh, and so it's important to keep that in mind when we look at this debate, uh, and then also as we look at all these other uh, controversies that we're going to address throughout the course. So then what are the specifics of uh, this controversy of Marcionism, this, this controversy between Marcion uh, and a number of church figures, but most specifically in our case, Tertullian? Uh, well, uh, let me explain a little of the, the background for you. Marcion, um, he was uh, an early Christian. Uh, think we, we think he was born somewhere around 85 to 100 AD um, in Pontus, which is part of modern-day Turkey, and that's the region you heard so lovingly described by Tertullian at the beginning of our uh, module. Uh, Marcion uh, was the son of a bishop uh, who was also a wealthy ship owner. Uh, and uh, again, lest you uh, immediately think something is, is weird there, um, in this phase in the church's history, uh, clerical celibacy was not a requirement. So it was not uh, unusual for there to have been a married bishop uh, at this point. Um, so he's the son of a bishop. Uh, he's quite well to do. Uh, and he travels at some point or another to Rome. Uh, and he starts teaching there. And again, not that unusual, right, for a wealthy Christian. Uh, to be able to travel around the Mediterranean a bit, uh, and if you're going to go somewhere and set up shop and teach, uh, Rome seems like a reasonable place to head. Uh, and so he's teaching in Rome around 135 to 140 um, AD. Now, he's there for a while. He makes, uh, in addition to teaching, we think uh, he made a significant monetary contribution to the church in Rome. Uh, but it wasn't too long until some problems crept up. Uh, and so uh, Marcion was uh, excommunicated by the church in Rome uh, and his money was returned to him because they quickly uh, discovered that what he was teaching did not fit with the faith as they had received it and as they understood and lived it. And so he spent the rest of his life after that excommunication from Rome uh, traveling around, continuing to teach and spread his uh, version of the faith until he died somewhere around uh, the year 160. So that's basically who Marcion was and kind of a brief synopsis of his career. Uh, so what is it that he was teaching? Um, well, uh, we don't have Marcion's uh, works. Uh, most of what we have of what Marcion taught we get from uh, his opponents, right, from things like Tertullian's work. Uh, but we can pretty clearly determine uh, some of the basic aspects of his teaching. Uh, obviously, uh, as I mentioned before, he rejected the authority of the Old Testament, right? So Marcion uh, does not accept the Old Testament as authoritative. Um, he thinks it's true um, in many ways, uh, but he doesn't think it's uh, spiritually authoritative for Christians, right? He thinks Christianity um, has a higher, superior um, source than uh, the Old Testament. So instead, Marcion uh, develops his own canon, right? And one of the things that Marcion is important for, <coughs> excuse me, 
is he is the first Christian to develop a defined canon, right? That is an authoritative set of books. Uh, so for Marcion, the authoritative texts are uh, a modified version of Luke's Gospel uh, and a modified version of uh, the collection of the Pauline epistles. So for him, it's going to be Paul and Luke um, with some key modifications that he's made that are going to be the authoritative um, texts. Now, going back to this idea of a true but not authoritative Old Testament and then his authoritative Luke slash Paul, um, those are going to relate to um, the two gods in Marcion's system, right? So in Marcion's uh, belief system, uh, there is a god of the Old Testament, and the Old Testament is true, but it's describing an inferior and, in fact, an ultimately evil god who is the creator of the world, who is the one that interacts with Israel uh, throughout the Old Testament. Uh, he really exists, but he's not a good god, uh, and we ought not to obey or worship him, right? What Marcion believes is that Jesus came along and revealed uh, the true higher God, uh, who is Jesus' father, uh, and that he is the God who is behind Luke and Paul, uh, and he is the one we ought to obey and worship. So we have two gods instead of one, uh, the Luke-Paul scriptures instead of the Old Testament and the whole New Testament. Now along with this dichotomy that he's drawing, in scripture and between the good and bad gods, uh, he also, as I mentioned before, rejects the body, right? So for Marcion, uh, bodily existence is inherently bad, is inherently um, evil, because it is associated with this evil creator god. Uh, and there, it's the life of the spirit, the life of the soul, uh, or the mind, that's what is good. And that's what we ought to pursue and focus on um, in our attempt to be united with uh, Jesus' Father, the good God. Um, so again, these are the, the, the key features of, of Marcion's belief system, at least as we can understand it from uh, the works of the people who were uh, arguing against him. Now it's easy to um, run through this list of the aspects of Marcion's belief system and kind of, again, break it into these bullet points and explain um, these are what things he taught, and then we can move on to why these things are wrong. Um, but one of the things that I think is important and that I want to try to do in this class that, that I think many times we either uh, kind of abbreviate or just skip altogether is to think about, you know, why is it that Marcion um, held this position or held these positions? Right, again, as I said before, nobody wakes up and says, hey, I really want to be uh, an arch heretic that people are going to talk about kind of spit on the ground afterwards for the next 2,000 years. Um, you know, Marcion wasn't seeking to lead souls to damnation, and certainly probably not to send his own soul to perdition. So why is it that he taught the things he taught, right? Well, one of the key things to remember in all these different controversies we're going to look at, or at least many or most of them, uh, is that, you know, Marcion is not reacting against a clearly defined set of church teachings in, in the way that we have them today, right? So uh, there was not a defined Christian canon at this time, right? There was no authoritative list, right? When the scrolls were passed around or, or the codices um, from church to church with these traveling missionaries, uh, you didn't flip it open and find this nice neat list of books that are authoritative at the on the opening page like we would have it today. Right? There was no defined canon. So when Marcion says, look, I'm going to only use Luke and, and Paul's epistles and with these little additions or subtractions rather, um, he wasn't rejecting a previously defined canon. He was the first one to do it. Um, when he rejected uh, bodily existence as good, when he rejected things like marriage as good, again, um, there was not a, a catechism where he was going and saying, oh, well, I'm not going to accept these bits and these bits and these bits. Um, again, there was not a defined church position, at least in our modern sense, on these issues. Right? So one of the things to keep in mind as we look at these figures is, um, in many cases, the reason we have clearly defined church positions on these different issues is because these controversies happened. Right? It's the heresy, it's the controversy that provokes definition by the church. Uh, and so, usually these initial figures that we're looking at 
are not rejecting a defined position. Um, what they're doing is taking a position that others see as rejecting an implicit assumed position of the church that then has to be explicitly um, spelled out. So that's one thing to be clear on. Right? The other is um, to acknowledge that Marcion is um, doing some things or is prompted by things that might actually kind of make sense when you think about it, right? That's um, when we look at the Old Testament, just like Marcion did 2,000 or so years ago, um, it's, right? there are passages that are going to seem uh, irrelevant, right? And I think for any of us who've ever tried to do the read through the Bible thing, there are going to be passages we hit in the Old Testament that we can think to ourselves, why on earth is this here, right? How could this possibly have any relevance for me? Uh, you know, we read in Genesis that, um, you know, Abraham went and sat under a tree. Well, that's wonderful. You know, I, I'm glad Abraham sat under a tree. But how on earth is that little bit of information relevant to me as a Christian 2,000 years ago, or 2,000 years later, rather, uh, in an entirely different uh, half of the world? Um, it doesn't seem relevant to us. Um, some of it seems incompatible with Jesus, right? That we read these passages in the Old Testament where enemies are cursed, where um, hellfire and perdition and all kinds of calamities are called down upon the heads of our enemies. How do we square that with passages we read in the Gospels, where Jesus teaches us to love our enemies, to turn the other cheek? Uh, this doesn't just seem like an irrelevance, it seems like something that actually is contradictory. Um, and in fact, there are passages in the Old Testament that will just seem patently unjust, right? When the people of Israel are commanded to wipe out an entire race, an entire group of people, how can we um, reconcile that with our belief in a, a God who is ultimately just? Uh, these are real difficulties. These are real challenges. Um, so Marcion is, again, not just setting out to be heretical. He's not just setting out to, to be difficult. Uh, he's looking at these passages, and his response is, we can't fix this, right? This is not something that is uh, a valid tension in our faith. This is something that we need to get rid of. And then, of course, what happens is, <clears throat> once you make that decision to reject the Old Testament, um, that's going to have consequences, right? And that's going to include rejecting the God of the Old Testament. It's going to include uh, rejecting the bodily creation that was made by that God, and so on and so on and so on. And so Marcion is going to be reacting to these very real um, difficulties, but he's going to do it in a way that ultimately uh, is not going to work uh, for maintaining a coherent Christian faith uh, and that is why uh, Tertullian and the church as a whole is going to end up rejecting him. Let's turn to Tertullian then, uh, tell a little bit about um, who he is. Uh, Tertullian, as I said before, uh, is not a contemporary of Marcion. He comes along uh, a generation or two later, uh, and we think he lived basically from around 160 to 225 AD. Um, now, Tertullian is uh, the first significant Latin uh, theologian. So prior to him, this is still pretty early in church history, right? When we talk about the church fathers, uh, most of them are going to come <clears throat> well after uh, Tertullian's time. Uh, but there had been a few other important church thinkers between the New Testament and Tertullian, but uh, they had all been Greek. Uh, Tertullian is the first one to come along <clears throat> writing and speaking in Latin who really makes some significant contributions to the development of, uh, of Christian thinking and theology. Uh, in particular, uh, you know, one of Tertullian's most important contributions uh, is he's really the one who first comes up with the term of Trinity or Trinitas uh, to talk about uh, God being three in one. Uh, and so that alone would make him uh, fairly significant, but he does, does quite a bit uh, beyond that. Uh, he, as we've seen, right, is a very vehement uh, defender of the Orthodox faith, faith against uh, Marcion and against other early heresies like uh, Gnosticism. Uh, and so he wrote a lot of books uh, defending kind of Orthodox beliefs, uh, particularly about the goodness of, of the body and bodily existence, um, against a lot of heretics who denied that uh, at the time. We'll talk more about Gnosticism. Uh, in the next module as well. 
Uh, and so Tertullian did, did a lot of important work for the, the church. Now one of the things I think that's important for us to uh, mention and to understand is that uh, Tertullian's history and status is um, a little more complicated than that. Uh, and if you look, for example, in your McGrath book, it talks about Tertullian. Uh, it will basically tell you uh, what I have just said. Um, and it kind of ends there. And it doesn't really point out um, one of the important things to understand about Tertullian is that he ends his life uh, separated from uh, the Catholic Church. Uh, that he had actually, uh, while he rejects Marcionism, um, unites himself with another movement uh, in the period known as Montanism. Uh, and as a result, he uh, essentially uh, is separated from the Catholic Church of his day. Uh, and uh, one of the things you probably picked up from looking at Tertullian just a little bit uh, is that he is very rigorous. Uh, he insists on very rigorous uh, morality. Uh, and he's very harsh in terms of uh, his uh, ability to accept post-baptismal uh, repentance for serious sins. Uh, and so as he sees the church moving uh, towards being more accommodating in some of those things, uh, he moves against it. Uh, now again, in, in the last few years, there's been some debate about uh, how much or whether Tertullian really separates himself from the church. Um, but the standard understanding is that he does, in fact, separate from the church and is a Montanist. Uh, and there is, in fact, in Augustine's day, several hundred years later, still a group of Christians in North Africa um, who are known as Tertullianists. And Augustine is actually the one who uh, finally brings them back into communion with the Catholic Church of his day. So this kind of rigorous uh, heretical offshoot, if you will, of traditional Christianity um, finds its roots in Tertullian. Um, and so I bring this up um, for a couple of reasons. One is uh, to make sure that we understand that even the, the good guys uh, that we're going to be looking at through the course are real people, right? And they are complicated. And in the case of Tertullian, um, they have some pretty serious complications. Um, but we shouldn't um, exclude them from our, uh, from our reading, from our respect as a result of that, right? When uh, Pope Benedict uh, wrote his book on the Church Fathers, he includes Tertullian despite uh, the problems later on in his life. Uh, that there is a great deal of good to be found in Tertullian's work, even though he errs uh, in some important issues uh, late in his life. And so one of the things, again, to make sure we, we pick up on as we go through this is that, you know, um, the real complicated stories of real incarnate uh, Christian realities are often messy and convoluted and complicated. Um, and God can even use flawed people, flawed figures like Tertullian, to do great good and important work uh, for his church. Um, so that's just an important thing to keep in mind as we look at Tertullian uh, and his response to Marcion and his work as a church father. So then, how actually does Tertullian go about refuting Marcion? Well, I'm going to give you some excerpts from uh, Tertullian's work to look at. Um, but one of the things that you'll see as you look at it is uh, Tertullian uh, was trained as a lawyer. Uh, he seems to have been trained as a jurist. Uh, and so he develops a very uh, careful, very um, clear uh, outlined argument against uh, pretty much every aspect of Marcion's belief system. Uh, so there's five books that make up his Contra Marcionum, his uh, work against Marcion. And as you can read in the preface, uh, it's really kind of his third try at kind of developing a comprehensive rebuttal of Marcion's uh, teaching and system. Uh, and in each of the books, uh, he attacks a slightly different facet of Marcion's belief. Uh, and so we can go through and you can see in each book there's kind of a different aspect uh, that Tertullian focuses on. So in book one, uh, Marcion Again, you can see there, there's quite a bit that he develops in book one uh, in terms of an argument. But really, uh, it focuses around the inherent uh, just unworkability of Marcion's uh, two-God system. Uh, basically, Tertullian goes through and shows how uh, the idea of 
two gods, the, the bad creator and the good father of Jesus, uh, just is ultimately, uh, it doesn't work as a coherent understanding of reality. Uh, that if there are in fact two gods, that neither of them uh, is truly God in the sense of um, everything we mean by God, that you can't be all-powerful, you can't be um, uh, without dependence on anything else if you are in fact balanced by and opposed by uh, this other deity uh, throughout uh, eternity. So we can go through and look uh, at that uh, and you can see for yourself uh, kind of how carefully and meticulously uh, and at great length uh, Tertullian really shows how uh, that sort of a system ultimately won't work. Uh, then in book two, um, Tertullian moves on uh, to show how uh, a god can't be uh, only good or only just, right? He has to be both. Uh, and one of Marcion's critiques of uh, the god of the Old Testament is that he is punishing people all the time, right? And we read, um, you know, God smiting this people, smiting that people. Uh, and for Marcion, he just doesn't accept this idea, right? That the God of Jesus uh, is this kind, forgiving God and wouldn't be doing those sorts of things. Uh, and again, you know, one of the things I mentioned before is that these heresies are perennial. Uh, they're always going to come back to us. And so um, I think for many of us, this should sound very familiar, right? It's a very popular idea in today's world to say that, that God would never really punish anyone, um, that he's only loving and forgiving. Uh, punishment is just some sort of weird thing that talks about in the Old Testament, but we don't really believe that in the modern world. Well, Tertullian uh, goes through and shows how, again, this idea uh, just doesn't really make any sense. Um, that for God to be truly good, he must also be just. And any God that's truly just uh, is also going to be, uh, in fact, good. Uh, moving on to book three, um, again, in all of these books, there are other things that are brought up, but there are some central um, themes that run through each of the books. So in book three, that, that central theme is to look at um, the connections between the Old and New Testament, specifically all of the prophecies that point to Jesus, right? And so one of the things uh, that Tertullian uh, pointed out in the, the previous um, couple of books is the idea that Marcion's God seems to just show up on the scene, if you will, uh, with the coming of Jesus. Uh, and so Tertullian asks very mockingly uh, in many places, you know, well, where was this God for all the rest of history up until Jesus? Uh, and so, again, here in book three, then he shifts a little bit and argues that um, if Jesus just appeared out of nowhere uh, in uh, Palestine around the time of Caesar Augustus, um, you know, that doesn't really um, have the kind of ultimate import that the Christian understanding does, right? Because this Jesus just shows up. Um, whereas in the Orthodox understanding, um, Jesus fits into a, a kind of comprehensive divine plan, that there are the prophecies uh, leading up to and pointing to Jesus, pointing out his significance, showing how um, God is leading up to this point, uh, and that there's a, a coherence that sort of ties together all of history around this central figure of Jesus. Uh, in the Orthodox understanding, right? And Tertullian says for Marcion system, when Jesus just shows up and does this miraculous stuff, well, it might be an impressive show, but it doesn't have that ultimate uh, kind of comprehensive meaning that Jesus does if he lies at the middle of uh, the Old and New Testaments, right? Jesus' significance stretches all the way back through history and forward into the future. Whereas for Marcion, it's only beginning with Jesus uh, and moving forward. And Tertullian says that just doesn't, doesn't ultimately make sense. Uh, and then in books four and five, uh, Tertullian goes through, and again, he just kind of, you can see the lawyer in him, uh, kind of just meticulously picking apart uh, Marcion's position. In book four, he shows how you know, if you recall, Marcion is going to only use Luke's Gospel and Paul. Well, in Book 4, he takes Luke's Gospel, and he goes through and shows um, how even with uh, Marcion's uh, edits to it, Luke's Gospel doesn't fit Marcion's beliefs, right? And specifically, that Luke's Gospel 
is intimately connected to the Old Testament, right? That there are all kinds of allusions uh, and connections with the Old Testament that we find in Luke's Gospel. Um, and um, there are all kinds of affirmations of the good of creation, the good of bodily existence, um, even in Luke's Gospel, right? Marcin had focused on Luke's Gospel and on Paul uh, in edited versions of them in order to kind of keep out as much as possible positive references to the body, positive references to creation or to Jewish history. Uh, but it's not really, you can't do that. If you keep any significant amount of the gospel, you're going to end up with still having positive references to the body, positive references to the Old Testament or Jewish uh, history, because that's the way really God made it all to work. Uh, and so Tertullian shows how even Marcion's edited version of Luke doesn't fit uh, his beliefs about the Old Testament and physical creation being bad. And then in book five, he turns around and does the same thing, basically, uh, with the Pauline epistles, showing how even the parts of the Pauline epistles that Marcin accepts contain all of these connections with both the Old Testament and uh, affirmations of the goodness of the body uh, and of physical creation. And so that Again, Marcion's own canon really doesn't support his positions and, in fact, uh, contradicts them and supports the orthodox belief that God, the one true God, is actually both working in the Old Testament uh, and the Father of Jesus, and that he is both um, uh, spiritual uh, and, but also gives us bodies, creates the physical world as good things and as essential parts of the human person. Uh, and of course this all wraps up with uh, an affirmation of the resurrection of the body, right? That just as Jesus was resurrected bodily, um, so the goodness of bodily creation is kind of ultimately affirmed in that. Um, and that is true as well for us as Christians, that we too will resur be resurrected as Jesus was and will be bodily resurrected. Um, and again, as I, I said a while back now, you know, all of these controversies are ultimately going to boil down to salvation. Uh, and so Tertullian is essentially arguing that this is the essence of our faith, belief in Jesus' bodily resurrection, body, soul, spirit, together uh, resurrected and reunited. Um, that is what makes our salvation possible. And our salvation is, again, a bodily resurrection, a, a uniting of soul and body for eternity with God. Uh, and so Marcion is undermining the very essence of salvation. And that, again, is why we get that passion that we heard so clearly uh, in our very opening passage. That's why Tertullian is rejecting this so strongly, is because he sees it as a fundamental rejection of salvation uh, and a threat to the salvation of anyone who would accept and follow Marcion's teaching. There's obviously a lot more that we could say about Marcion's teaching and uh, a lot more we could do in terms of looking at Tertullian's response to it. Um, but we'll get into some more detail in our, our other controversies. For this one, this is just kind of an initial test case. Uh, but before we leave it, I do want to just make kind of two final points uh, to wrap up our time here for this first module. Uh, one is just to um, illustrate for you uh, this idea that I've referenced a couple times now, and that is that these are issues are perennial. Um, that this debate between Marcion and Tertullian is important, not just kind of in a historical sense of understanding how the church develops its positions, but because we face these very same uh, situations today. So uh, if, for example, we were to turn and listen to a uh, prominent critic of Christianity today, they could say something about uh, the God of the Bible and the God of the Old Testament in particular, very reminiscent of Marcion. Now, how do we as Christians respond to this sort of attack? Well, again, this is why I think studying church history uh, is important, right? Because when we hear this sort of criticism, we don't have to come up with an answer on our own. That answer has been given. Uh, it was given uh, almost 2,000 years ago uh, by Tertullian and others, right? So an understanding of uh, history isn't just an academic issue, right? It can really be relevant as we try to explain and share our faith uh, with those around us. 
Uh, and again, even when we look at the, these modern critics, right, it's very tempting to just write it off and say, well, they just hate Christianity, or maybe there's something bad in their past, or maybe they're just bad people. Um, but again, we need to be honest and look at these passages in the Old Testament and recognize that there are real difficulties there. Um, and that we can, in fact, recognize that challenge, but then show that there are other ways of addressing it, and that there are problems with simply uh, cutting out the aspects of the Bible or Christian faith that we don't want to accept. Which leads then to the final point, um, that as again, as I've said a couple times now, when we get answers to these different dilemmas or controversies, uh, it's never really the end, right? That any answer we're going to arrive at is always going to prompt further questions. So in this case, uh, when we uh, reach the conclusion that yes, the Old Testament is authoritative for Christians, we do need to keep it, um, this then raises the question of, okay then, what do we do with these difficult passages, these passages that seem irrelevant or uh, that seem uh, even unjust or incompatible uh, with Jesus' own teaching? How are we supposed to deal with those? And that's then going to lead us to our next module when we're going to look at uh, the controversy uh, surrounding the heresy or heresies known as Gnosticism. Uh, and the Gnostics, uh, generally speaking, accept the Bible, uh, but they're going to interpret it in, in a whole host of different ways. And so our challenge in the next module is, once we have a set of scriptures, how is it that we ought to interpret them? Uh, who's going to make the kind of a final authoritative decisions? How are we going to view the body? All those different issues that we've looked at are going to come up again just in the next level of the discussion. So there's always more to discuss. There's always more uh, to understand, uh, which is a nice segue into um, leading you all on to take a look at the discussion boards uh, and uh, give your own answer to some of the questions I will pose there and, and discuss and talk amongst yourselves. And hopefully through all of that we will uh, arrive at some answers which will then lead us, of course, on to, uh, to more questions. Uh, so for now we will wrap it up. Uh, and I look forward to hearing uh, your thoughts on all of this on the discussion boards.